Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Hello, and welcome to the Pros and Cons podcast, where sometimes we feel like pros and sometimes we feel like cons, a podcast for emerging writers by emerging writers. Today, I'll be your host, James Healy, and I'm joined by Matan Elul. Hi. And Ali Burnham. Hello, hello. Today, uh, we want to talk about mysteries and what makes a mystery story. So what is a mystery story and what is the mystery genre? A mystery is a story where an event, typically a crime, almost always a murder, has taken place and the story follows an investigation into that crime, typically through one character central to the investigation who inevitably solves the crime and confronts the culprit. The mystery story can most aptly be described as a puzzle because it puts the reader in the position of being the detective alongside the protagonist trying to work out who did the crime. They are an extremely popular form of story, both in literature and TV and film, with tons of subgenres. Everyone is familiar with the whodunit, where a murder is committed in an isolated place with a select cast of characters and only a certain number of the characters could have done it. And there's also the procedural, which follows a police investigation into a crime, again, typically a murder, but these can also be heists or abductions or serial killings. There are many, many, many types of subgenres of mystery. I'm not going to get into these two specifically today because I want to discuss kind of the basic elements of creating a mystery story so that these can be applied to any other type of story. Nothing spruces up a story like a bit of intrigue and mystery. The Harry Potter series repeatedly introduced mysteries in the form of having the heroes sabotaged in some way and wondering after which of the students or teachers were behind it. Game of Thrones season one and book one uh, also was somewhat constructed around Ned Stark's investigation of the death into the hand or the previous hand more like. And these elements only serve to heighten the engagement and intrigue of story and keep the reader turning pages. To that end, there are no sort of books and lengthy website blogs dedicated to giving advice on how to create mystery. But don't worry, listeners, you don't have to go hunting around like a detective. The pros and cons teams are going to try to distill some of these basic elements of a mystery for you today by discussing the hook, the breakthrough and red herrings. Firstly, though, can I ask you guys, without spoilers, uh, what were some of your favorite mysteries that you've read? Um, okay, so I'm going to say two that are just remotely different. Uh, first of all, I love it when a mystery starts with a corpse, but one of my favorite mystery books slash movies actually doesn't start with one. Shutter Island, mm. well-known Martin Scorsese movie, was actually uh, a book from 2003. Uh, not going to go into details, just one of these movies that's just a joy to watch a second and a third time. Because uh, for those of us who watch it again, you just see these this trail of breadcrumbs that is so satisfying to to catch. Um, on the other side, one of my favorite mysteries and possibly one of the cutest mysteries is The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Hayden, which has one of the most unique detectives you've ever seen. Uh, it is a character with mild autism. And it is an absolute joy to follow him. And it does start with a corpse. Not going to go into the details. Really great book. Forgotten that book. That book is awesome. Yeah, so good. Yeah, I'll jump in with, uh, I, I like it because I don't think it's a, an obvious example of a mystery. But I just wanted to talk about Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere as a whole. We need and a counter for this guy. I mean, he's reaching every time Stephen King in... levels. Of, uh, yeah. Oh, it's just because like every time I'm on. <laughs> Who are we going to mention more, Brandon Sanderson or Stephen King? Uh, basically, because my my relationship with the Cosmere is one of puzzle unlocking and finding clues, finding connections until you get the, oh, my God, that is actually that or that person is the same as that person and that person's been there all along. Like, so so there is these little mysteries to be solved all along that, uh, that reveal the world building. I'm not quite sure how to explain it because it's not your typical, there's an open question. The characters then work to solve it. Then we get an answer. It's a, as a reader, we might even not know that there's a mystery there yet. Like a, a characters have like an understanding of the world. And then we get, new information a fresh understanding and you get a massive whoa moment yeah. things weren't how i thought they were it was different all along so and that's really satisfying and he's very intentional that he knows his fan base is playing this game at this point and it's like you go and read the five different 
books on the one thing and there'll be a single <laughs> clue in each of the five books wow. and you bring it together and then you're like, oh my God, that person's on that planet. And like, that's just the reveal of after this very small breadcrumb following. And that is, it's quite addictive. I haven't quite had that experience before, except maybe the Harry Potter series. I, I was the early days of one of these internet people around book five, six, seven, when that was coming out and like the, the infamous Harry Potter forums, it was kind of the first fandom that I, I recall really did that where people are trying to nut out what is a Horcrux? Like you, you just had enough information to be like, what is a Horcrux? What could be the next Horcrux? What clues has she left um, by around that book five, six, seven? So it's that big fandom unpacking of minor clues. Not to uh, go on think Brent- too much of a, not to go on too much of a tangent, but as mm. an early reader of Harry Potter, the fact that Dumbledore and Voldemort never share the screen in the first few books, not going to lie. <laughs> that, that gave uh, you a, a false a few lead. He just happens to go to London and Voldy shows up. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just basically going to say all of the Cosmere as a, it, I have such a fun intellectual exercise relationship with the Cosmere, following clues, piecing it together and chasing those aha moments. I remember it was something like that with the Game of Thrones, the mm. Jon Snow, Daenerys link. Um, that was kind of something yes. that the books hadn't gotten that far. It sort of existed outside of the books where people were trying to work it out. Yes. So, yeah. As much as I love a mystery novel, I love when novels that are in other genres bring in mystery and create these kind of hooks and this sense of intrigue as well. But that sounds very cool as well when it's something that's spread across five books that isn't necessarily oh, linked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, try 30 at this point. He's still Oh my going. God, okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, it sounds like we've kind of hit on some similar points. We have a, a sense of intrigue, we have an interest in crime, and then a, a good detectives to follow. Um, so this brings me to my first point, and I might be mixing terms here because I'm going to use the term hook, um, and Ali, you might correct me on this. Because uh, the hook usually refers to something in the early stage of a story that kind of gets the reader's attention. It might almost be like the premise, something that reels you in. The hook in a mystery novel is com- kind of combined with just the early stages of the crime and kind of introduction of the characters. Because that's kind of the most important time to catch the reader's attention and to create that strong sense of intrigue and that strong interest. The hook is really important. A hook is important in every story, but it's particularly important in a mystery. Yeah, there needs to be just a high level of engagement early on in order to get you committed to the investigation. This can be accomplished through having a great detective, like in the curious case of the dog in the nighttime, uh, to which the story is told. Uh, Have an interesting setting as well that plays into how the crime went down or affects the investigation that can unfold. Hogwarts, of course, is a really interesting setting. It impedes how the children can move about the school and there's magic involved. And you've also got situations where, you know, maybe the cop is out of their jurisdiction or something like Shutter Island, where the characters were, you know, they were very much locked down and it was controlled where they could investigate and stuff like this. Also, by introducing a number of characters who become suspects, um, either because of motive, means or opportunity, uh, having them appear early on in the story as well. Uh, and as a side note, uh, most mysteries, in particular whodunits, tend to introduce the culprit early on as well, but they may not necessarily become a suspect right away. But the most important way of hooking a reader in a mystery novel is by having an interesting and memorable crime take place. Um, mm-hmm. Is it a complicated or particularly gory murder? Does it have the authority shocked or baffled? Is the victim an incredibly important, loved or hated person? Do they appear to be one way on the outside, but the investigation shows um, that they lead a more complicated, morally great life instead? So I wanted to open up to ye and think about... Um, Matan, you said that you like when a story starts with a corpse, so that often is like the crime is introduced almost right away. Um, But can you tell me something about your mysteries that kind of hooked your attention early on? Gonna be honest, I just, uh, if we're going back to the curious case of the dog in the night, the cover of the book has a dog with a pitchfork in his stomach. Uh, Mm. A a cute dog and a cute pitchfork. It wasn't that gory, but it does make you think like, oh my God, who would do that to a poor puppy? And just the cover hooked me and then I open and lo and behold, page number one, the dog is already a goner. And uh, that just grabs you and I love it. My own story in the plug, 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 plug in the new mythic precipice fiction. My own story starts with a corpse. So I do like that. Just paragraph number one, 
other than that, uh, if we're going back to the Harry Potter books, sometimes she she stacked so many mysteries on top of mysteries. Something that jumps to me um, from book number one is the the hook of the sorcerer's stone. It's not exactly a who done it, but why are they taking it? Who who are they keeping it from? Who's going after it? Rather than who killed, it's who is going after the Sorcerer's Stone. Is it Snape? Is it somebody else? It ends up being uh, someone unexpected, which is the cowardly uh, professor that I don't think any of us suspected on our first read. At least I didn't. So yeah, the, the murder definitely goes, but especially if you're writing for kids, maybe more of like a less violent threat could also be the hook. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It, it's how I've thought about it. There, there is the mice technique um, that talks about the inquiry thread and inquiry, an inquiry story is essentially a mystery, um, but it, it's kind of structural formula is that a story has an open and close bracket and just how strategic you are in when you open something and when you close something. And inquiry argues that your story starts when you open with a question and then your story must end when you close that bracket and answer the question. So, so it's a structural tool to think about if you've answered your question, it's time to like get out quick kind of thing. Or it's a way of measuring your story if you're starting too early or too late. Because you're just like, look for your bracket. When do you actually open your question bracket? When do you close your question bracket? And that, that's kind of what you're saying, Matan, is that it doesn't necessarily need to be a dead body but the question can be why is there a dead body on the floor that's the question bracket you have opened your story ends when you close that bracket but it doesn't need to be a dead body it can be who has done this other thing who's left this mysterious thing out who's caused this curse like it whatever your question is um that's basically when you've opened your your inquiry thread you've read the six of crows right ali Yes, I have. Six of yes. Crows also starts with a terrific uh, hook that kind of leads into a mystery where you got this uh, new drug running around that mm. makes these, the wizards of that world so much more powerful. And right off the get-go, we get something going on with that drug and the question arises like, who's bringing it in? Why are they doing it? Yep. What's happening? And I never read the book series that came before Six of Crows, which happens in the same universe, uh, Shadow and Bone, right? Yes. And the fact that the hook of Six of Crows was good enough to catch me in the bookstore, I think that just alludes to how powerful it is. Mm. Speaking of um, structure and the inquiry structure, um, one of my favorite detective novels is called um, Every Dead Thing by John Connolly. And this opens with, yeah, it's pretty dark. <laughs> um, it opens with a cop coming home to find his uh, wife and child brutally murdered. What? And the story then jumps a year ahead and he's quit the police force and become a very dark figure and he's a private detective and he's given a, a kind of a job by a friend to track someone down and in the process of him engaging in this mystery information starts to come up about the murder of his wife and kid oh, wow. so structurally they end up doing something where the first half of the story is it follows like the kind of mice thing because they introduce the information at a certain point but the first half of the story is one mystery kind of a fairly straightforward following these leads and this information comes up and they investigate these people. But then the second half of the story jumps into this other mm. thing, which links back to the beginning of the story. So really very structurally interesting. And then it obviously involves something that's so personal to the detective and, and that he's like kind of gone following this himself. So that was really fun. Man, what a start. That's a crazy start. You know? that's a, <laughs> it's, yeah, wow. Yeah. If, if you're a, into bleak and dark stuff it is which you are kind of james healy yes, which you yeah. very much are i've read a bunch of uh, the john that's connelly like, series that's like a gut punch before breakfast you know to start off like yeah that. yeah yeah so i'm gonna do i'm gonna jump now to the end um the end of a mystery story because mystery novels typically something that must be like the crime itself uh pretty well planned out uh, which is why i've never successfully written a mystery novel <laughs> um, there are certain expectations of the genre you have a crime, a detective, an investigation, a culprit, and inevitably a breakthrough in which the detective figures out who the culprit is. So the breakthrough is slightly different from the twist. The twist, which can still take place in a mystery novel, um, is a surprise in the narrative, like a crack in an alibi or a new clue, uh, or often an old and overlooked clue that now has new relevance because of what we've learned since that clue 
came up in the beginning of the story. And the twist usually involves something that sets the investigation on a new path and often a path that leads kind of directly to the culprit. The breakthrough, on the other hand, is a final piece of the puzzle that the detective uncovers to solve the case. Sometimes the detective gets this and doesn't immediately share it with the audience, but shares it with the audience pretty soon afterwards. Finally, you have the conclusion. And this is the point where all of the information is kind of laid out and everything is wrapped up. In your average detective or procedural story, uh, this information usually happens after the culprit is apprehended or killed. But in a whodunit, this is often the scene where the detective confronts all of the cast and lays out all of the information, then confronts the culprit. Either way, these three things tend to happen in pretty close proximity. If you're a twist, shortly followed by your breakthrough, shortly followed by your conclusion. Because like Ali said, you want to kind of close all the loops that you've opened at the same time. This typically happens at the end of the story. Uh, so can I ask Yi if you can do it without giving too many spoilers? <laughs> um, or some memorable twists or some memorable breakthroughs or conclusions in a mystery stories that you liked um, I, I think Harry Potter is fair game <laughs> I, have, I, have to, I have to steal Ali's favorite Harry Potter book um, I know it's your favorite, <laughs> the third one but it just has this legendary confrontation scene mm. um, what's it called the, the Whomping Willow the, what do you call it? yeah, the Whomping Whomping Willow during the shack, you know, you got Sirius Black oh. you got the, the new Professor uh L- ramus lupin you got the rats you got the kids uh all in one place <laughs> and it's yeah. just everything comes out i don't know who's the detect i guess harry's the detective yeah but it's it's such a great scene and the movie did it so much justice uh so i thought they really just spill it out everything that you've gathered uh you got this you have the twist that the rat is actually peter Pettigrew and uh Man, that's a great. And I guess the most important thing in that twist as well is the fact that Sirius Black is not the villain of Mm. that story. He's actually, you know, the the stepdad figure who's been trying to protect Harry. And Harry, like, it just twists his whole perception of what his life and future could be the moment he learns he could. uh, Yeah. And Lupin as well. Lupin is suddenly, wait, do I know this guy? Because there's a moment there that you think, wait. Ali, would you say that the clues we were given as readers were fair game? Like, could we have figured this out? I think so. I I think that's what JK does quite well. And that's why she did manage to spurn such a a massive, spurn's not the right words, uh, cultivate a a massive like internet forum. Everyone's picking apart every small thing because her clues, they are in there. And if you look hard enough, you can be like, oh, A plus B equals C and like even just Remus Lupin's name, you can be like, uh, <laughs> maybe it's something Lupin. to do with a werewolf. Yeah. <laughs> if you just look close at it, like those are the best twists where they just make sense in hindsight where you just, and that's why it's almost hard for me to sit down and think of a twist because some of my favorite twists, they're more like inevitabilities. Mm. And you look back at it and you're like, the story was always building up to that shocking thing. And that's just really exciting and really rewarding. Um, I'm trying to think of what I had jotted down for some of my favorites. Um, While you're reading that, I'll just, I won't give the name yeah. of the book, but one of my favorite twists, probably the second or third chapter, the main character sits down with another character at a diner, a friend, and they're having a chat about the crime. And this character is sort of only mentioned then for the rest of the story. And he is involved in some way, but he's only vaguely mentioned. And then at the end of the story, they find a body. And realize that it's this character's daughter, the, the friend character. When the friend had mentioned at the very beginning, haven't seen the daughter in a while, she's gone away this, she's gone away that. And you realize that uh, it was the friend who was the killer all along and that the daughter had figured it out and then uh, he had taken her out. And it's one of those pieces of information that only the main character puts together. Mm. So the main character is then alone and knowing what happened and not knowing what to do with that information. So really fun stuff. Uh, you know, James, you know how sometimes you look at people and they have this really particular diet, like they only eat protein, they only eat meat, they only eat no gluten. Sometimes I look at your reading diet and I think to myself, could I have survived that? Could I have made it through James Healy's reading list, you know, whole? <laughs> what would have happened to me if I just jumped into your library once? Would I have made it? I would have been a changed man, that's for sure. Just sitting in a corner rocking back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> the scary diet 
I remember what I was going to say. It was um, I, I called Harry the Harry Potter series a cozy mystery to someone the other day, and I blew their mind because uh, they they had never thought of Harry Potter as a cozy mystery before. We think of it as like an urban fantasy, and I'm like, no, structurally, it's a cozy mystery. It just happens to what's, be wearing um, fantasy clothes. <laughs> what's a cozy mystery? What makes it cozy? Uh, I, I, the stakes aren't quite as gnarly. So in James's example of you walk into a room and there's a, the family's been butchered and there's blood everywhere and a you know chain smoking detective has to solve it. So if that's more your just mystery, Out of boiled, yeah, yeah, cozy mystery is uh, you're a bit more of a maybe it's a young girl, so a plucky young girl solving the the mystery and. Uh, no, no one's going to get outright shanked in a dark alley throughout the, <laughs> uh, okay, the, the course of solving the mystery. But there, there's still, still something to solve and bad people to bring to. Uh, it, I think it's a term marketed by the by trade books because some people want it, the puzzle and the intellectual, but they don't want the gnarly. They don't want blood on yeah. their page, yeah. but they, they still want, want to engage with solving a crime. Would I be right in saying, because I haven't read them, but the Agatha Christie's would be? Yeah, Moses. yeah. Yeah, it, it tends to be a small small village. Uh, yes. And the person who gets murdered is usually like a very bad person. Yes. Um, <laughs> and they may not have been murdered for any deeply emotionally scaring reason. It's just kind of like, oh, I wanted to be the best cook in town. So I killed, <laughs> killed the person who cheats at the cooking competition kind of thing. It, is it actually ever the butler or is that just like a... A cliche. I'm sure that's a cliche that comes from somewhere. Yeah, yeah it must have <laughs> the been the butler, the butler at least once. Yeah. But that's that's a great twist because you've got all the characters sitting at the dinner table, and your direction is just your focus is just pointed at them, and you don't think about the person who's bringing the food in and out, the person who has most access and probably most yeah, motive but, to get away. But with now, it. But maybe it was just overused. Mm. Now you would. Now you like the first guy you'd look at is the the butler. I mean, you say that, but nobody suspected the rat in Harry Potter, so. Oh man, that rat! Right, <laughs> he slept with him. He slept with the rat. How can people just move on like that's normal? He gave him bats. That's that is the true tragedy of Harry Potter. Ron's relationship. A grown the man. Trail of trust. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, th I think I think there's something to be some analysis to be made here that I will not make right now. <laughs> Before we move on, I'll do a quick shout out to some of my favorite procedurals. It doesn't quite answer your question, James, of um, stories that have like a good twist that caught me, but just TV shows that over time have been a good story engine for it. Uh, so in my mind, a procedural can be div divvied up into the subgenres you mentioned in that a mystery is slightly different to a heist and a detective story, again, is slightly different to a crime story. Because in detective, you're on the law enforcement side. In a crime story, you're on the, the outlaw um, side of the same crime and getting away with the crime. Uh, now, it, it's a good one to pick apart because it was infamously terrible, uh, but lost. The mm. like I'm remembering those early seasons and the hype around those early seasons in that it was that true water cooler talk of everyone was tuning in to watch the early seasons of Lost and being like, where's this going? what's the black smoke? Why did they land there? What's the hallucinate? Like just all those really big questions people wanted answers to. It was truly event-driven television that eventually lost the audience's attention when no hard answers were given, uh, yeah. which is uh, probably a good lesson to, to any writer being like, if you, if you don't give answers or evolve your questions in some way, you're going to lose interest. But it was such, it must have been such a successful hook for everyone to be like, oh my God, what is lost? What is happening? What are the questions? But you know, that that that's a, such a great example. And it brings me to something that I don't like in certain mystery uh, movies, novels. I don't like the stealth sci-fi. Like when you're reading a mystery novel, but you don't know that it's a sci-fi novel. Do you know what I mean? You don't mm. know that they're actually inside a spaceship in cryogenic stasis. And this is all the hallucinations of the cabin crew. Like, it's a cool concept. It's a cool gimmick. But an example is uh, the Netflix shows 1899, which is about mm. a bunch of people on a ship that's, uh, they find a stranded ship and it's all like this Victorian era mystery. You know, there's a kid, he doesn't talk. And then in the end, it turns out <laughs> that they're all from the future and none of this is real. It just feels <laughs> a bit, I feel a bit cheated out. Like, I would not have been able to guess this 
this is outside of the scope of the it's Does that make yeah sense? you're right it's not a twist you can pick it's more just a shock twist it, it yeah. reminds me of trigun what you're describing a little bit so my relation my housemates have watched the original Trigun, but I hadn't. And then we sat down to watch uh, Trigun Rampage, which is uh, they're just barreling through the plot and they, they're doing the reverse thing. So I, I had to be sat down and told this, but infamously a Trigun pulls something about 10 episodes in where it does the genre twist that you're talking about, Matan, where you think you're watching a Western and then it goes, lol, this is a sci-fi. Um, everything is explained by a, a ship with the lot, like some of humanity crashed here. And now a Western frontier appeared because of this. But you don't have that information from the start. But the version of the story I sat down to watch, this retelling like 30 years later, they just it starts on the spaceship and the spaceship crashing. And my housemates turn to me and they're like, that's not the version of the story you were meant to get as a first time watcher. <laughs> so it's very... It, very interesting that they've just decided, well, that's not the twist anymore. We're not going to lean on that as a genre twist. We're going to tell the same story differently um, and just leave that shock twist out and rely on different mm. beats is, is a fascinating adaptation choice. Yeah, I feel like uh, definitely the twist needs to be like established, at least be able to guess it as we're going mm. through. So I'm going to try to tie the beginning and the end together um, because now you have like an interesting crime, a detective, an interesting setting. And you've come up with a great conclusion in mind or your great twist for the end of the story. So how do you bridge the gap between both of these and make your mystery or intrigue plot engaging for a reader? So on the one hand, you can use, um, or you have to use, um, a balanced strip feed of questions and clues. This is similar plotting to the promise and the payoff. Um, you start with a bunch of questions about the crime, begin the investigation, start to have simple things answered. But more questions arise. This is where loss went wrong. (laughs) (laughs) They just lean too much on questions. And then you begin to provide clues that close off certain question treads, open new leads, and eventually direct focus of the investigation inevitably to the culprit. So how do you do that? One way of doing that is by having a cast of interesting suspects and memorable characters who, for one reason or another, obstruct or impede the investigation by being unhelpful, suspicious, or outright lying for one reason or another. But you can only milk this for so long at the early stage of the story because there needs to be a sense of pace and the detective needs to make some kind of progress. But again, they can't get straight to the culprit. They have to make progress and then have setbacks and failures. Uh, so this brings me to like the meat of my point, which is, in my opinion, the best tool in a mystery writer's toolkit, uh, which is red herrings. And we might have all heard of red herrings, but like, what exactly are they? A red herring is essentially a false lead or a false trail. The phrase comes from a William Cobbett story told in 1807, in which he used strong smelling smoked fish to divert hounds off the trail of a rabbit, the fish being red herrings. Um, And this is exactly how the device is used in a mystery story. Um, The writer has to arrange or present information in a way that points away from the culprit and into a dead end or onto another suspect. Early in the story, you can get away with it just being a dead end, even if that dead end turns out to be correct later on. But later on in the story, for drama's sake, you kind of need the red herring to be another character or a suspect in some way. Usually with the, maybe like most mysteries will have maybe two red herrings be suspects. And usually the second suspect will be someone who the detective actually confronts um, only for him to be immediately cleared Mm -hmm. and for the detective to be left embarrassed and have absolutely no direction what way to turn, which then brings us to like the dark night of the soul. Detective spends some time drifting in the wind and then comes back with a renewed effort to investigate resulting in your twist or breakthrough and conclusion of the story so i open it up to ye on uh, characters that kind of drip feed of clues and uh red herrings um serious black for example being a great red herring in uh, the third harry Potter book i like serious black as a red herring but i prefer the og uh severus snape because mm, yeah. while i mean serious black is kind of shoved upon Harry by the world. Everybody else tell him to be careful of Sirius Black, whereas Snape is Harry's own conclusion. Harry draws draws the conclusion that Snape might be a threat. Nobody else gives him a poster and says, ooh, Severus Snape might be a dark wizard. So I think as a reader, it's more satisfying to, to kind of follow on Snape with Harry, whereas Sirius Black, it doesn't feel like a mystery. It just feels like, how did he get out? With Snape, you're not quite sure, is he the threat or not? Because Harry is not a million percent sure. 
So mm-hmm. I think as, as far as red herrings go, I, I prefer Snape. Other I than that, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I couldn't give you an exact example, but a show I feel like does this quite successfully time and time again is House. Mm. But it's yeah. almost baked into its formula in that, uh, yeah, it, it's the medical mystery and the question is, oh, what is wrong with this person? And the, the clues you have are their different symptoms and sometimes the body the, the, the patient will take a turn and there's new information and what uh, they thought was the problem is not the problem anymore. And, and so usually, uh, yeah, whatever the initial diagnosis is or a symptom is the red herring or an information about the patient's life is a red herring that leads the doctors down the wrong track trying to solve it. So it's I think that's a very satisfying use of the red herring and a very mercenary use of the red herring because they're, they're using it every episode, but it, it is quite successful um, as a watcher. You're like, oh, that makes sense that that plus that equals that. And then you're like, oh, God, it's something else altogether once you have new information. But how do yeah. you how do you write a good red herring? Like, I, I assume you have to draw a line that you <laughs> cannot cross with your misleading clues. Like at some point, your reader is going to get upset. Like you it's know what I mean. It's more how you arrange the clues. Mm. Um, so the, the best way to write a successful red herring is to kind of convince the uh, the reader and the detective that this is where the the story is going. And um, we've all seen like the CSI episodes where they have a suspect fifteen minutes in, and you kind of know it can't be possibly him. be them because there's another no. yeah there's another forty five minutes <laughs> too soon. The show they're not going to catch the person yet. <laughs> um, so you sort of have to not necessarily write the red herring, but just have the information presented in such mm-hmm. a way where it points to this person and no one else. And um, one of my favorite mystery shows was The Killing, which is a police procedural about an investigation into a murder. The investigation, I won't say how many seasons it went on for, but it went on for quite a while. Um, and it kind of played out in real time. And the detectives ended up looking into multiple people. And each time they look into someone, you feel oh, this, this, this is probably the person. Mm. If you're not looking at how many episodes there are in a season, you do start to feel this is the person. And the way that they pulled that off in the killing was that they made it really complicated for how they would like, arrest this person. It wasn't just a straightforward, oh, we have this person. They felt like it was that person and they were trying to find the evidence to get them. And there was some reason why the person would be tricky to apprehend, um, either because they were important political figure or because they were involved in like the criminal world and therefore were good at evading police and stuff like this so that was one way of pulling off red herrings was that it was more about the cops feeling and because the cops felt this way they were coming up with evidence and you were following along them thinking oh yeah they've they've got it now so that was very clever you know an example of a show that i actually really enjoyed the show but i felt like they went too far with too many red herrings to the point that uh, it's called The Bodyguard, uh, a BBC show. Maybe one of you heard about it or watched it. And it's a basically a major character gets killed off halfway through and it becomes like a major whodunit. But they give too many characters reason to be behind it. And by the end of the show, even though one of them is singled out as the culprit, they haven't really explained why not the other ones because they still have right. their reasons. And I feel like it's kind of not fair when you give me three prime suspects and all of them have reason to do it, but you just pick one in the end. Does that make sense? <laughs> it could have been yeah. any of them. Yeah. No, I, I get how that's not satisfying and that it have, you haven't proved the innocence of the others, <laughs> only the guilt of one. Um, I, I wanted to draw attention to uh, another show I thought was really successful, uh, Broadchurch. Um, so different to House, where the structure of House is every episode is a new mystery. Broadchurch is one of the longer form series where the mystery is over the, over the whole season. It's been quite a while since I've watched it, but I, I remember the, the emotion that show left me with was the entire time never being quite sure who it was. And as you're saying, Matan, there's several good suspects uh, but it was quite satisfying when it lands on, oh, it's that person for this reason. And I, I think that is a, it, it's also what uh, James was talking about earlier, where the detective's personal plot gets woven into the core mystery plot a little bit uh, to help sustain a long form narrative like that. So they, they may be going through the process of the big investigation at the same time, you know, their inner conflict is being triggered by 
what they're dealing with, what they're seeing. So you you have these sub brackets, these subplots of the the detective dealing with their own thing as a result of the investigation. That's a very neat weaving of plot threads to keep it sustained and going. You can also do that, but um, it's good to do that with setting as well. They say that the setting should always play into the play into the crime or play into the mystery in some way. Yeah. Also, if you like set it in somewhere like like an interesting environment, like a desert or up in the snowy mountains or something like that. This gives you a lot of interest and stuff to work with. Yeah, I, I realized I, I've technically written a detective story. And so, so I wanted to take a step back and unpack what I did exactly. So I'm talking about the Metropius comic books specifically. That that's I wrote it almost like four little episodes of a mini arc of a story. And I realized what I, what I have written wasn't a typical whodunit. So there is a, someone is missing and the main character needs to find who is missing. It is fairly procedural in solving the crime. And I, I took a step back to be like, well, what am I actually doing there? And it's because the, the main point of this four arc series is it, the focus is more on what I was saying before in that trauma from the main character's past is being brought up. So he's, We learn that his wife had also gone missing in the same way. He starts to see the similar connections for the the crime he's currently solving. So it's it's more dealing with the trauma and what may have happened to his wife while he's going through the day-to-day solving of the current uh, missing person's case. Uh, But at the same time, have either of you played Firewatch, the video game? Right. I I don't want to spoil it, but there's a moment in Firewatch where it it was this beautiful mo- like emotion that I wanted to try and capture where you you kind of turn a corner like something's been missing someone's been missing you turn a corner and the game does such a good job of framing the reveal it's just a moment of visual where you just see it you you get the information it's not a an it is an aha moment but rather through because it's a video game you're you're first person walking around the corner and then you just see it at the end of the game it, it's beautifully framed and I'm like I I love that inevitable. It was that simple. There's the reveal. Uh, so, so I hope to achieve something similar with the four episode uh, Metropius thing I've written, and, oh, and cool. I hope I pull it off. But I realize what I what I'm doing is what the detectives learning more that he didn't know at the start was about people in the city, how they treat each other, how how the law enforcement works and was impeding him, how the circumstances led to this inevitable discovery is kind of the, the, what's the more important information rather than, oh, this person was found here and this is what happened to them is less almost less important to these are the social things that led to this thing happening. And Matan, you would know this, that uh, in Save the Cat, this is called more of a why done it rather than a who done it. Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah, so it's less about discovering the single person responsible and Emotive. case closed, but uh, this is the in- we've learned about the environment and the the stru- like the social structures that have led to this crime happening and this greater world understanding. Uh, Chinatown is the example. Save the mm. cat uses. So I I guess that's what I was trying to do when I when I had to ask myself. Well, I I have written a very simple one plus two plus three procedural, but I, I think it's because I was more interested in the why done it than the who done it of that structure. Well, uh, going back to your own work, to Metropius, which I've read the first volume of. Uh... One of the hooks is that you have your detective uh, protagonist in a certain state in his life at the beginning, but then the flashback presents a mm. vastly different status quo for him. So you got the hook of the missing person, but you also got the hook of, wait, what happened to all the things he had? Where are they right now? And I do love that in a show, especially when I know from the start that it's going to happen. Because one thing I, I don't like is the cliche of the of the beautiful family that you're just waiting for them to die because there's no way he's going to keep them. You know, I've got a lot more patience for it. I know from the get-go, the wife's not going to make it, you know, instead of her just, you know, having this beautiful scene at the start, you know, they're kissing goodbye. And okay, just kill her now. Just spare me. (laughs) Spare me the the cheesiness. Other than that, yeah, Tropius was a great read. I'm looking forward to finding out. I still don't know. When when do yes. we get volume two? Oh, right, hopefully soon. I've started to see. What do you mean, late. hopefully? I had... <laughs> you just finish it. Uh, it. 
It's up. Well, I've finished it. <laughs> it's not up to me. Um, okay. I've seen the layouts Sorry. for the future um, uh, comic releases. So they're, they're in the pipeline. They are coming. This is the first time I can push a writer in person and I'm going to take advantage of my position. <laughs> okay. So in conclusion, what you want to have is an engaging hook, an interesting crime, an interesting detective, um, probably a setting which is involved in some way in the crime and affects how the investigation can take place. An investigation involving multiple suspects and red herrings leading eventually to a failure or setback of some kind. Have your detective recommit to the investigation, have your twist, breakthrough, and finally your conclusion where the culprit is apprehended. And that's uh, the basic elements of mystery. You don't have to go reading through multiple how-to novels or scouring through pages and pages and pages of uh, website blogs on the advice those are your basic elements and if you employ them well uh, in any story not necessarily a mystery story in any story you'll raise the sense of intrigue and keep uh, the reader engaged and keep them turning pages matan do you have a quote i do have a quote and we're kind of breaking the rules here uh, were there rules in place were there rules about the quotes is there a book of <laughs> we had rules? loose rules there should but, uh, be. yeah we can, so we can bend them <laughs> well what's happening is that we've got a quote but it's from an astronaut and not just any astronaut it's the original well he's not the original astronaut, astronaut. but he's like he's the first <laughs> moonwalker uh neil armstrong okay. <laughs> neil armstrong uh he said mystery creates wonder and wonder is the basis of man's desire to understand and hopefully the desire to buy your books so there you have it <laughs> yes um and the new mythic is available on amazon for anyone you know, who is interested in there uh, yeah a little bit of a that, plug. that was smooth. That was smooth. Mm, yeah, excellent transition. <laughs> All right. So this has been a pros and cons. If you've enjoyed listening, please do leave us a review on your prospective podcast listening service. Thank you very much, listeners. Thank you, James. See ya. Bye bye. Did yeah. I miss anything, or is that the? No, oh, that was good. I think. Very good. You're listening to Pros and Cons. The Precipice Fiction Podcast.